We thank you too for the rain that you brought this country. We need it. It's been a big, big blessing. We ask, Lord, that you be with us and pray for justice. Give them strength, give them courage, and protect them. Protect their families. And give them the right decision. Whatever your choice may be. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Y'all be seated. Great. 
Amen. Amen. I thought we was going to go back and say, how great is our God again? I was, I was just going. That's good. Thank you all. Good singing this morning. Yeah, you better let me at it if you want to get out of here any semblance of a time for lunch. You just cut it short, brother. <laughs> well, you know what happens if I cut it short. It kind of does this. <laughs> I don't know who was singing that wonderful harmony back there somewhere over, and it sounded so awesome. Usually, I'm the only one singing harmony that I hear, but. I, I was singing both. <laughs> I believe that. Now, I used to have a, a device in my sound system when we were on the road that I could actually sing a trio with myself. It was, it was awesome. It's, it's really fun. Uh, and to watch the faces of people going. <laughs> and, and so uh, it was a track, so it could have been done with the track, but it wasn't, it was done with this, <laughs> this uh, digital, but digital world. You ever thought much about the importance of mothers? I mean, we celebrate it this time of year. We, Back in um, 1864, a lady named Anna M. Jarvis was born. She lived to, uh, till 1948. In May the 10th of 1908, she decided to celebrate her mother. And she did a memorial and a church service and gave everybody a white carnation and uh, had a real tribute uh, to mother. And word kind of got out and it went around. A few states started adopting and churches having different little celebrations. But in uh, 1914, Congress decided by proclamation that the second month Sunday of May would be Mother's Day. If you've not pondered the importance of mothers, think about it this way. If it were not for mothers, this would be a very empty room. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of you may not have had the privilege of giving birth, but You've mothered so many children over the years in your own way. And there are a lot of other mothers that are mothers because of situations. What about the grandmothers that have raised so many children? But mothers are around because that's why God chose to do business with life. <clears throat> Where's my picture? I was supposed to be before. <laughs> yes, I did, but anyway. Anybody know where this house is? It's like four stone. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it located? Alabama. No, that's where his friend was. Uh, no. Yeah, Viola Battery was where Bubba was from. Mm -hmm. And the house, Greenbow, Alabama. Well, being an Alabama boy, I was kind of proud of that. You know, I kind of stumbled into this sermon today in a way. I shouldn't have put it that way. So, <laughs> from my perspective, it kind of came in a different way. But that's the Forrest Gump house, which was actually erected in North Carolina on an 8,000 acre plantation where a lot of the battle scenes were even filmed. But none of that's really important. I, 
Remember this? A mother said, Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You know, we can look at that and think of that, but it's really profound in a way because as we know, life has a lot of uncertainties that come sometimes trickling into our life and sometimes they come like a flood. A lot of wisdom. There's a lot of statements in that movie. We kind of watched it by default yesterday. I thought I was going to watch NCIS and I flipped over to the channel and it was Forrest Gump and I just couldn't change it. Mm -hmm. You remember the statement talking about the uncertainty of life. You remember the statement after Jenny throws rocks at her abusive dad's old house. And she finally throws enough rocks and gets one through the window and the window breaks. And then she just starts crying profusely and falls into a hug, they do. And she had already lived a lot of life by then. And he says, you know, sometimes there's just not enough rocks. <laughs> yeah. You feel like you're doing battle. But my favorite statement, you remember after he had gone <clears throat> off on his, I think his ping-ponging, but anyway, uh, he and Lieutenant Dan found each other on New Year's Eve in New York City. And Lieutenant Dan was kind of, had been involved with the submission work in town and, and, and not involved other than being on the receiving end of ministry. And they, he said, they kept asking him if he had found Jesus. And he asked Forrest, have you found Jesus? And of course, you know how the movie is narrated by the voice of Forrest. And he said, I didn't even know I was supposed to be looking for him. I think there's a lot of people in that boat. There's a lot of people that are exposed to a lot of things, but they don't know that they're supposed to be looking for Jesus. Just like the little boy I mentioned in Sunday school, went to the Christmas pageant and was going home with the family that had invited him to the Christmas pageant and he said all the great things about the pageant and the animals and all of that and he said, but who's this Jesus guy? There's a term called post-Christian. Most of us grew up in the era of Christianity being prevalent, but it's not that way anymore. But we know that it's never going away. A zillion years ago, Billy Graham made a statement that he figured just based on his knowledge of people and experiences in churches and around churches and talking to lots of pastors and preachers. He said, he, he kind of estimated that about 50% of all church members really didn't know the Lord. Jesus made an incredibly interesting statement. You remember when we were 
were talking about the Sermon on the Mount last week. And here, Jesus is kind of finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. It's in chapter 7 of Matthew. And 20 verses 21 through 23 read like this. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name driven out demons and performed many miracles. Then will I tell them plainly, I never knew you. Not all prophesiers and not all professors, that's people who profess, not as in educationally, but it could be applied that way. And not all performers are going to go to heaven. They're going to be part of a group we will call this morning Heaven's Absentees. first group is called the convicted but not converted. I was a Baptist preacher, so I was pretty much like the iconic view. Kind of feisty. Probably a concert. <coughs> I was a little sport. So I probably had a complex about that too. But when I got to high school, I had a, a number of guys that I played with in the band who were Hispanic. And I would do my Baptist thing and they would do their Catholic thing and go to confession and mass and I'd go to church. <coughs> it was obvious about some of the things he, we said and the things that we like to do that we had a, con a conflict in our personalities in terms of how we wished we could perform life a little bit better because we were convicted of some of the things that we did, but we weren't converted to Christ. So there's a difference between convicted and realizing that they, something might not be quite right and being right with God through Jesus Christ. Conviction causes one to try to do better and realize that things are not as they could be or should be. But the power of living life victoriously is not there because there's only conviction, there's no conversion. It's one thing to have an intellectual understanding of what God expects. It's another thing. A convicted person knows who Jesus is and knows that he's out there, but a converted person knows him. Knows him personally. And the second group, that was the convicted but not converted. And the second group was the religious but not regenerate. There's all kinds of religions in the world. I've heard some numbers, but I won't do that to you today. I mean... And it's like a lot of people even have their own religion that nobody else knows about. Some people worship their lifestyle. Some people worship their animals. Some people worship 
in a church. But you remember in Acts chapter 10, there was a man named Cornelius. And it says, Cornelius was a devout man. He, he was actually in a group of people from the Jewish perspective. He had adopted Judaism as his religion. So he was called a devout man. <clears throat> he adhered to all of the Jewish ways. And so, if you read the passage, it reads like this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God, they call them God-fearers. With all of his household, he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly a vision, an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and, devout so and a devout soldier, another one of the, we could call him a Jewish believer, uh, the Jewish version of a believer, who those who attended him and having related version to them, I said a Jewish person that day, we have many Jewish people today that are believers in Jesus Christ. Well, the next thing that happened is God sends a vision to Peter. And Peter's, Peter expect these people to come and get you and go with them and, and do what I tell you to do. Well, between the fact that we find out that he is a devout man and he is adhering to the religious uh, Jewish religion. 40 verses later, it tells us that he received Jesus into his life because Peter preached to him. Jesus. We must tell people about Jesus. When Jesus left, he said, go. And he said, tell them, baptize them, teach them, disciple them. <laughs> religious? Cornelius was very religious, but he didn't know Jesus. And the third group is called the baptized, but not born again. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. I remember a friend of mine telling me that another friend of his called him and had won some people to the Lord and they needed to be baptized in his church but he never baptized anybody so my friend went over to his church and they got down in Philip the baptistry got down in the baptistry and he practiced on him I think he said I got baptized 14 times <laughs> but being dunked in the water doesn't make you a Christian or even being sprinkled with water, if that's the baptism you choose. We Baptists would say that's not complete baptism because it's not going beneath the water. It's not like a burial. That's why we do it the way we do it. Because it's the way John the Baptist did it. So. You can be baptized by water, but if you're not baptized by the Spirit, it doesn't matter. 
Some have been dipped in the baptistry, but they're not washed in blood. And you can be sprinkled, you can be submerged, but if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you don't have Jesus in your heart. If you've not made a conscious decision, I've become a follower of Jesus Christ. And this is the day I'm establishing my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But there's one more thing. I don't think we Baptists talk about this enough. We used to a lot. I remember growing up, I heard this a lot. Did you know that most of what we know about hell came from Jesus' lips? It's true. Most of what we know about hell it's from the lips of Jesus. There's some things you need to know about hell. Hell is for eternity. Hell is forever. In hell, your flesh burns, but it never burns up. It's a feeling like falling head over heels, if you've ever had that dream. But you never come to the bottom. place of helplessness. It's a place of torment. Luke 16, 23. In hell, you remember Jesus is telling the disciples, and this is from Jesus' lips here. Jesus is talking about this rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had it wonderfully under, under <coughs> tow as far as life itself and the physical things of life and all of the goodness that life has to offer, and he had it. And Lazarus would eat the crumbs. Really, they would purposely throw things out so that they could do that. And, and, and the people could eat really pretty much a decent meal that fell from the table, so to speak. And so it says they both men passed away. In Jesus' words, in Luke 16, 23, in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham afar away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. So agony is a good description of, of hell. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus received bad things and now it is com he is comforted here and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. Some people use this as, as an as a statement that you could actually be saved after you go to hell. Ain't happening. This is clear. This is perfectly clear. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send, uh, uh, go back to verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here, from there to us. And he answered, then I beg you, and then he got missionary minded. Can you send Lazarus to my father's house where I have five brothers? I want to warn them. And so Jesus tells us about it's not going to do any good if somebody comes back from the dead because they haven't believed what I've already said. The Bible teaches us very clearly The words of Jesus talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And the word again, born 
from above again is the maybe a more literal translation. But it's a birth that doesn't come from earth. He's separating the concept of an earth rebirth. Nicodemus, you remember, said, well, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? No, this is a spiritual birth. This is a, a new birth, we call it, because it's a new beginning. It's a step into a whole new existence and way of life. It changes us forever. When Jesus was preaching the, the Sermon on the Mount, he said so many <laughs> things that left the disciples scratching their heads because it was so foreign to the way they had been brought up. I don't know what you've heard about Jesus, but let me tell you, Jesus is the only person on a historical record that died for someone else's sinfulness. And on top of that, he rose from the grave to prove I am the son of God. I am God incarnate, that is, in the flesh. And no one can go to heaven by phraseology, yes. But no one can go to heaven. No one can have the best life that's available on this earth as a precursor to going to heaven. But if you want the best of this life, come to Jesus. If you want the best of the afterlife, come to Jesus. Hell is a real place. I don't know that we know remotely how bad it is. Life can get pretty ugly down here. And we've heard people say, and maybe even we ourselves have thought, you know, this is hell. I'm going through that. It's, it doesn't even come close to the real place. But it gives us a little bit of a eye-opening of how bad it really is. When things are bad here, things are way worse in hell. We've all been through lots of stuff. Every one of us in this room. Heartache, pain, misery, joy, love, Jesus. Don't be one of heaven's absentees. Don't just be convicted, be converted. Don't just be religious. Let Jesus regenerate you from the inside out. And don't just get baptized Location's not important. We got a good baptistry. Probably a bunch of you have been baptized right up here. Or maybe in one of the local creeks. <laughs> I've baptized both places. Remember the eunuch said, here's much water. What scenery we can be being baptized. And he was told, you need to know Jesus. You need to know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus today, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I've been wrong about all this. I need you because I can't take this life any further. Because I'm, I, I want to go to heaven, yes, but I want the best this life has to offer. And you, you hear me often say this. But you don't need to have an elaborate prayer. You don't need to have one verse of scripture memorized. You don't need to know anything about the Bible. And the only thing you need to know about Jesus is that he died to save you from your sin. And if you want to be saved from your sin and eventually go to heaven, just reach out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. Or Jesus, I want you. Or like that publican 
that said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Just realize you sinned against God. And Jesus paid the price for all of the sins you will ever commit when he died on the cross. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the power of the gospel. <clears throat> thank you for the power that's given us because we know Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And when we proclaim the truth of God's word, that it does its own miraculous changing. I pray, Lord, that everyone under the sound of my voice that's having question marks in their own heart would today reach out to you, Jesus, and take you into their life. Jesus, it's in your mighty, magnificent, stupendous, wonderful, exciting name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Can you stand, please? Sorry. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me.